Hey guys, Carlson here to discuss Unit 4 with you, which covers Chapter 7, The Muscular System. Uh, due to the complexity of each section, we're only going to cover through 7.3 today for Part 1 of the video lecture. So remember that muscle tissue is highly specialized for contraction, so everything we talk about is going to be related to how our muscles contract. Uh, we need this so that we can move, whether it be internal functions or externally with our entire body. We know that skeletal muscle tissue is the most abundant uh, muscle in the body. And then remember there are actually three types that we discussed in Chapter 4. You have your cardiac muscle tissue that forms your heart. You have skeletal muscle tissue which forms, again, most of your primary and major muscle groups. And then smooth muscle cells help to line and protect all of your organs. Now we're going to focus in on the skeletal muscle itself since it does uh, form the majority of our muscles. And there are five primary functions, uh, movement of the skeleton we mentioned, maintenance of posture and body position like being able to lay down and stay laying down, stand up and stay standing up, support soft tissues uh, by providing support to carry the weight of organs and also to protect. They guard entrances and exits by encircling those areas of the digestive tract and the urinary tract. And then they also help maintain body temperature by the contraction of muscles, which plays a role in homeostasis of the body by keeping the temperature up uh, to a certain degree, 98.6 to be exact. Now, 7.2 talks about the structure of the skeletal muscle. Now, we have to have muscle tissue, connective tissues, blood vessels, and nerves, and we have to understand the structure in order to understand how contraction works. So, uh, each cell of the skeletal muscle is a muscle fiber, and in each fiber there are hundreds and thousands of organelles called myofibrils. They contain actin and myosin, which are very important to contraction, you will see here shortly. The organization of skeletal muscle contains three layers of connective tissue, the epimysium, Epi meaning on and mys being muscle means it's the surrounding tissue and it's made up of collagen fiber. So it just lines the outside of that muscle. Within each muscle then we have fascicles which are little compartments and the periosteum basically surrounds these fascicles which are mostly just bundles of fibers themselves. They contain blood vessels and nerves to help supply the vesicles with what they need to function. And then finally, the endomysium is inside and supports the muscle fibers themselves. It surrounds and ties them together. Uh, here's another look right here of uh, a one fascicle focused in on several muscle fibers in there, and the endomysium is surrounding each one. There are stem cells scattered to repair tissue. You can see one right here. There are capillaries to supply blood, and then nerve fibers can control the contractions because they actually go all the way through to the endomysium and you see the axon of a neuron labeled right here. Okay, so at the ends of each muscle, those three layers of connect connective tissue come together and they're going to form either a bundle called a tendon that connects muscle to bone or a broad sheet called aponeuroses that connects different skeletal muscles like this palmar aponeurosis right here. Tendons uh, do provide their firm attachment by hooking onto the periosteum of bone. While, like I said, the aponeuroses, there are broad sheets that just connect skeletal muscle to skeletal muscle. All right, discussing the role of blood vessels and nerves, like I said, they're, they're found in the epimysium and the perimysium. They deliver necessary oxygen and nutrients to the muscle, and then they also carry away any metabolic waste that is generated by the activity of a skeletal muscle. Now, muscles can only contract under the stimulation from the central nervous system, and axons can penetrate the epimysium. They will branch through the perimysium to reach the endomysium, as you can see here. So we have a muscle fiber here, and we have some myofibrils and here is that axon terminal that is reaching all the way through to a single muscle fiber. This controls the fiber and results in voluntary muscle contraction but we do have some uh, voluntary muscle contractions that we do subconsciously such as breathing. Otherwise we kind of instigate it on our own. 7.3 uh, discusses skeletal muscle fibers and their distinct features, and so we're going to get into a lot of uh, new words here. However, 
there's something we can relate to when we talked about the basic cell structures and functions all the way back in biology. So they are different from that typical cell you learned about, and the primary reason is their size. They could be as long as 60 centimeters, which is the same as 24 inches, and those muscle fibers are multinucleated, so they have more than one nucleus, which is not really what we're used to when we look at those basic models of a cell. Now, focusing in on the organization of a single uh, skeletal muscle fiber. You can see each one has, like I said, many, many myofibrils, and then we're going to break those myofibrils down into it, its parts as well. So the first thing is that sarcolemma and T-tubules. The sarcolemma is the plasma membrane, okay, or the cell membrane of the cell, which in this case is the muscle fiber itself. And it surrounds the sarcoplasm, and then the Small openings in the sarcomel lead to these T tubules, almost kind of reminding you of pores. Now, we also call the T tubules transverse tubules. The role they play is in muscle contraction by providing a passageway for electrical impulses. Now, moving on to the myofibrils themselves, their T tubules encircle each one, and you can kind of see them in here. And then they are, the myofibrils are as long as the muscle fibers themselves. Uh, they are made up of thick and thin myofilaments consisting of those proteins we talked about, actin and myosin, and scattered throughout our mitochondria, which we shouldn't be surprised because remember, uh, they are the powerhouses of the cell and your muscle cells need a lot of energy in order to contract. You're also going to find some glucose granules in there uh, for support of muscle contraction as well. Okay, same diagram, we're going to take a closer look at a couple of different parts. Uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, again, remember the endoplasmic reticulum is that kind of like membranous folded passageway. Here, uh, the T tubules are tightly bound to this membrane, and on either side, there are these expanded chambers called terminal cisternae, and you can see them here in here and they provide a high concentration of calcium ions so that when contraction begins because of the release of the calcium ions they are providing a way for those ions to get to the sarcoplasm. Now the sarcomeres they're they're repeating functional units of myofilaments and there are about 10,000 of them arranged end to end of the myofibril. They're the smallest functional unit of the muscle fiber itself and you can see by their structure how they might provide that banded appearance that the skeletal muscle tissue makes or otherwise known as striations. Now to take a closer look at the sarcomere structure, uh, the, these filaments by the way do not span the length of the entire muscle fiber like we had talked about every other part of the structure. There are thin filaments though at each end that make up what they call Z lines and you can see that the Z line kind of looks like several Z's. Uh, the Z lines extend toward the center, uh, passing among thick filaments uh, to create this zone of overlap. Then we have M lines, and M lines are made up of proteins that connect each thick filament to its neighbor. And you, we of course have these terms called A band and I bands. Uh, that form these Z lines and M lines and if you remember the A band equals a dark line you know and it has an A in it the I band is talking about a light or I band and basically the combination of these dark and light bands like I said is what form these striations and what we see as a banded appearance on the skeletal muscles all right, there are thick and thin filaments like we are mentioning right now, and those thin filaments are actually twisted strands of actin, while those thick filaments are the myosin molecules that have a tail with a globular head structure. So here's a closer up picture of the thin filament, and you can see the actin molecules. And here is the thicker structure of filament, and that is what is carrying the myosin. And remember, the reaction between these myosin and actin are what make our muscle contractions happen. So here's that myosin globular head, by the way, the label kind of got cut off. And its interaction with the actin molecules, again, is what allows us to contract our muscles. Okay, so we did hear a little bit about that sliding filament theory uh, from the crash course video. And what happens when the sarcomeres contract is the I band is going to get smaller, 
Okay, so here's your eye band. It's going to contract and slide up, so it's going to get smaller. The Z lines then, of course, are moving closer together. The H band is going to decrease because you have, and you see it's smaller here, so here's the H band before contraction and after contraction. The zones of overlap are going to get larger, and then the A band is not going to change at all. So the only way that that actually makes sense is if we look at the sliding filament theory and the thin filaments slide toward the center along the stationary thick filaments, meaning that the thick filaments don't move and the thin ones do. So the interaction of that myosin head with that actin molecule, like I just mentioned, is called a cross bridge. And basically it goes through a repetition of a cycle um, that means we attach, we pivot, we detach, and then return. And that's talking about that myosin head with that actin molecule. Now, I think this process actually occurs much more smoothly than this quick video I'm going to show you just for fun. Uh, it's a scene from a friend's episode. It's called the pivot scene. So we'll see if you enjoy it. If you don't want to watch it, you don't have to. Um, and we'll come back and talk about part two later. Okay. Go left. 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 There's no more left. Left. Okay, you're gonna uh, lift it straight up over your head. Straight up over your head. You can do it. You can do it. Okay. You got it? Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay, you got it, right? You got it, right? You got it. <laughs> Any chance you think the catch looks good there? You know, just, just follow my lead. Okay. Pivot. <laughs> 